Sadie, I know this podcast is all about the practical applications of mathematics and statistics, but do you ever feel like you're still stuck in the ivory tower? You mean, do I feel limited by talking with academics about their research? Yeah. I think almost every single one of our episodes focuses on a PhD researcher's field of interest. And compared to the rest of the human population, like me, that's an overrepresented sample. Wow. Throw statistics back at me to make a point, huh? Someone had to. <laughs> okay. But yeah, you're right. Invariably, we end up focusing on research done within universities or research institutions. But there are interesting, fun ways that non-mathematicians can get involved in mathematical research. The only way that we can map sort of our automated processes onto uh, a human perception is to get some humans to tell us what they're perceiving. And so that's where this project came from. But before we get to this project, we should introduce ourselves and our guest. Guests, plural, actually. But you're totally right. I'm Sadie Witkowski. And I'm Ian Martin. And you're listening to Carry the Two, a podcast from the Institute for Mathematical and Statistical Innovation, aka MC. This is the podcast where Sadie and I talk about the real-world applications of mathematical and statistical research. We might sound like an odd couple to tackle these topics. I'm a cognitive neuroscientist, and Ian is a high school choir teacher. But today, we're going to show you that you don't need to have a degree in mathematics to help further research in mathematical fields. So let's meet our lead researchers who put together a study that relied on lots and lots of non-expert people participating. First up, we have Axel. Crowdsourcing is like, a, let's say, a more fuzzy in terms of motivation from the, from the people who really provide the annotations uh, in, in, inside about media or something like that. Axel Carlier is an assistant professor at the University of Toulouse in France, and he conducted this particular study with a fellow researcher, professor at Occidental College in Los Angeles, Catherine Leonard. Perceptual studies are often a part of shape, mathematical shape research, if you're building models to represent a thing that humans care about. So I'm hearing about shapes and crowdsourcing, how does this tie into non-academic research again? Right. We're kind of throwing around three separate terms here. Crowdsourcing, citizen science, and community science. Crowdsourcing, I feel like I've heard of. Like, it's like when you get a crowd of volunteers to help out on a project, maybe collecting data or doing a specific task. It could be even as simple as an online poll. Or something more complex, like responding to CAPTCHA requests, where you have to identify all the images with like a bicycle in them. By getting lots of people to respond to that question on a set of images, you can actually develop a big data file that you can use to train a visual machine learning system. Right, I've heard that before. So how does that differ from citizen or community science? My understanding is that citizen science is a slightly older and more common term, but is similar to community science. I actually like the National Geographic's definition of citizen science, that it's the practice of public participation and collaboration in scientific research to increase scientific knowledge. Okay, so then how is that different from community science? Well, citizen science was originally meant to distinguish amateur data collectors or analysis from professional scientists. But it's taken on connotations around citizenship status, i.e. where you were born or how you came to live in the United States. So community science is a more inclusive term for the same idea. And using community science focuses on the social nature of such data collection or analysis that it's about the collective action undertaken by a group of people, not just individuals. Honestly, these all kind of sound like different ways of saying the same thing. Like, a couch is a sofa, is a place where I spend most of my free time. <laughs> I could make an argument between the three, but when it comes to statistical research, like what we're discussing today, maybe crowdsourcing is the best term. Uh, because crowdsourcing is a term that has been uh, created to, de to designate these situations where you need to ask people that are not necessarily experts in a field uh, their advice on something, which uh, in our case was uh, how do you uh, segment the shape. And so in crowdsourcing, people don't necessarily know that they are actually helping science in any way. Whereas in citizen science, I would guess that uh, they know <laughs> because uh, it's been made clear. Uh, so I would at, at least make this difference 
in our case, we we may let them know that we did that, but uh, but uh, it's not necessarily always the case. Oh, so like MTurk pays people to distinguish between a corgi butt and a loaf of bread. You might not know how you're helping science, even though computer scientists are using your responses to teach AI to tell the difference between them. Yeah, Axel actually brought up the example of MTurk or Mechanical Turk as a really common way we see this kind of crowdsourcing for scientific research. Of course, uh, Mechanical Turk that Axel mentioned often pays incredibly tiny amounts of money from a U.S. dollar perspective to people um, in other countries. And again, that's that's kind of exploitive. I would imagine that community science and citizen science, on the other hand, involves fully voluntary participation, um, uh, a conscious decision to participate. That makes total sense. But let's get to the meat of this episode. How are Catherine and Axel using crowdsourcing for research? Well, let's start with the why. Okay. Why are Catherine and Axel using crowdsourcing in their research? (laughs) I'm so glad you asked. Uh, Human perception is super wriggly. In the 20s, a psychologist tried to write down a list of rules for perceptual similarity. And for every rule that he wrote down, he could find a bunch of examples that followed the rule and a bunch of examples that didn't follow the rule. And so he had to add another rule. And his conclusion was, there is no set of rules that can encompass human perception of similarity. Catherine explains that the research on understanding shape starts from this primary conundrum. It's really hard to parse complex shapes into their constituent parts. So this project came out of a much larger project on shape understanding. So if we want to automate processes that can take a new shape in, figure out what its parts are, figure out which parts are similar to each other, and maybe based on that similarity determine that this is an elephant and not a refrigerator. That requires kind of an understanding of what the important parts are to humans. So if we want to teach computers to recognize parts of an animal or distinguish between two refrigerators with different organization, we need to understand shape perception. And we need to understand how humans do this weird, poorly defined process before we can even hope to teach computers to do something similar. Hence the crowdsourcing? Exactly. How did they advertise this project anyways? I mean, I'm all for furthering science and whatnot, but I wouldn't even know where to get involved with a project like this. You're not wrong. Most community science projects are run by nature conservation organizations or science museums or other nonprofit organizations. For this research, mm, they took a different tack. So Misha Collins is an actor who was on Supernatural. Wait... Isn't Supernatural that show you've been obsessing over with those two guys from Texas? Okay, I wouldn't say obsessing. I mean, I would. Uh, Did this episode just become a ploy to make me talk about Supernatural? No, no, I promise. We're getting there. So he likes to get people together to do elaborate and pointless activities. And so he developed this Gishwiz scavenger hunt. So Gishwiz stands for the greatest international scavenger hunt the world has ever seen. And so the second year of Gishwiz, he, uh, the first year was just kind of a small little by mail thing. And the second year he took it online and he needed help coming up with items for the, for the scavenger hunt list. Don't tell me they somehow got their study added as a scavenger hunt item. (laughs) You guessed it. Not that this was Catherine's first time contributing an item to GISH, as it was later abbreviated. Sometimes we would troll people, like there was one year that we put the Riemann hypothesis on as one of the items, proving the Riemann hypothesis. Yeah, so we had little inside jokes, but we also we also got into the fun. Riemann hypothesis? It's a famous mathematical conjecture that many consider to be an important unsolved problem in pure mathematics. And they made that a scavenger hunt item? Well, the item actually ended up being kind of a sort of joke reference to it, but we're getting off topic. Right, because you want to go back to talking about Supernatural. Because I should explain why crowdsourcing through GISH was particularly helpful for their study. I simultaneously was working on this research project where we needed (laughs) to crowdsource. (laughs) Um, And so I thought, aha, 
I will put this as an item on the scavenger hunt and then people will be super excited to do it. We'll get a lot of response. It's international. So you won't have the usual Western bias um, that you often have in these perceptual user studies. And the teams will get points for their participation. And so they'll want to do a good job. And so we did. Remember, the I in GISH is for international. A lot of crowdsourced research have issues with bias that come from all the people looking at the images having the same cultural background. Oh, so that can skew the data. But in this case, you have people from all over the world participating. And you have highly motivated people. Right. Like you want to do a good job and earn as many points as you can for your team. And a third aspect that Catherine and Axel didn't mention was that by connecting their research to this event, they were able to collect a bunch of responses within a relatively short period of time. Because the scavenger hunt had a deadline. Although that turned out to kind of almost be a problem. So we had to launch our task at a particular moment and there was a few days and then it was over. So it had to work because, uh, because otherwise the <laughs> there was no second chance. And actually we had some... Difficulties, <laughs> but uh, technical difficulties, let's say, bugs, basically, uh, which uh, we managed to, to correct on time, <laughs> but it was not so easy. Let's come back to the difficulties, but what even were the images that people were segmenting? Well, it's a collection of a bunch of natural and man-made objects called MPEG-7. Yes, the distinction between uh, uh, natural objects like animals, uh, for example, or humans, actually, I think there are humans in the data set, in contrast with uh, artificial objects that have been uh, made by humans, uh, it was important in the data set because uh, clearly there's a there's semantic that comes in, in place. And of course, the semantic can be different if the objects are natural or artificial. So, So this was important in our choice, I think. Okay, so like a picture of a dog, but... Also a picture of a tractor? Yeah, but without any color or detail and just the outline. Okay, so what was the difficulty that Axel mentioned? Actually, I didn't anticipate was the number of uh, participants that would do it at the same time. And so when our task was posted, a ton of participants directly connected to the website, which was hosted on the university server and not a very powerful one. <laughs> and so the, the machine just crashed. <laughs> <laughs> Basically, the university server wasn't ready for so many people to try to access it all at once. Gish accidentally DDoS attacked the server, you know, when the website gets flooded with requests and shuts down. But seeing as they still look back on this project fondly, I'm guessing they managed to make it work? Yeah, they were able to get it running smoothly enough to collect quite a few crowdsourced responses. We, we collected quite a lot of data because I, I, I think in the end, most, more than a thousand participants annotated uh, shapes and on, on all our shapes, which was nice because since uh, we, we know that people have different perception of the shapes, we wanted to have uh, redundancy. So multiple person annotating the same shapes so that we can, we can actually infer that, uh, yes, there are multiple different interpretation and all are valid. Once they had all these images that multiple people had broken into parts, how did they analyze it? Let's take a short break and I'll explain to you when we come back. Now that we're back, let's talk about what Axel and Catherine actually found. How learning of how humans break up the visual world can help us better teach machines to do the same thing. Right. So through GISH, Catherine and Axel had over a thousand people take these images and segment them into parts. But did they tell them to break up like an image of a cow into hooves and the flanks and the snout or? Actually, no, you couldn't give specific instructions because that would bias how people segmented them. What is difficult in this tutorial is that you should try uh, uh, to avoid biasing the the. the... The participants. So the goal was not to explain them you should uh, annotate like this. It was just to tell them this is the tool that you, it's really to discover the, the tool and then uh, let them freely annotate. Honestly, it's not like people follow instructions anyway. I can write out very clear directions for a worksheet or test or something, and then also tell my students exactly what to do a million times, and I will still get at least three kids who have the audacity to ask, wait, 
what are we doing? It's like they want me to come individually and explain it to just them. <laughs> Funny you should say that. Yes. Uh, one thing you learn when you do these kind of experiments online is that uh, people do not read the instructions. That's the, the rule of thumb. So you should always assume that since people won't read the instructions, you should try to at least make them do something to show that they understand to some extent what they are doing. <laughs> so turns out no one really reads instructions, apparently. But that didn't stop Axel from trying to write up something clear and concise that participants would hopefully understand. You should have lots of people read again the instructions to make sure they're understandable. Especially when, like me, you're writing in English and it's not your mother language. And especially it should be people who are not in math or computer science because uh, uh, people who, who participate in English with are probably, most of them are not computer scientists or mathematicians. So, so yes, they will react different than just the, the, the colleagues at the lab. Right. Get an outside opinion on how you're teaching people to do the task and then discover no one reads the instructions. Sounds about right. <laughs> right, the bane of every instructor's existence. Okay, so let's skip to the part where they collected all the data and all the segmented images. Right, so the first step was to compare an image to see how much agreement there was between gishers, or er, I mean people. And they did this through spectral clustering. Spectral clustering? It's a multivariate statistical technique. Jargon. Okay, imagine a bullseye made out of a bunch of discrete points. If we use traditional statistical methods, you can't identify the inner dot from the outer ring. But spectral clustering allows you to recognize those patterns in the data as separate. For a given shape, let's say you have 25 annotations, so you get uh, 25 by 25 matrix, uh, which tells you for each couple of annotations how different they are. Uh, and once you can, once you did that, you can cluster the the, the annotations using spectral clustering, and then uh, for each of the clusters, we were able to produce, let's say the. So we, what that means is that each cluster of annotations uh, regrouped annotations that look a lot like, it, like like each other, and from there we we produced some kind of majority votes of the annotations within the same cluster to produce. Uh, uh, yeah, the, the final uh, final annotation that is a, a summary of all these annotations from the same cluster. I thought I understood, but I think I'm still kind of lost. Okay, let's try a teacher-based example. You know those plastic transparencies we used to put up on projectors before PowerPoint slides? Oh, yes, and I always loved being called up to write on them. <laughs> <laughs> so imagine everyone got the same outline of a cat that they had to break into parts. And then you laid everybody's work on top of each other to see if we segmented the tail as a part and the paws as a part. Spectral clustering is basically just a fancy way of looking at all the different annotations and seeing if users clump. So are there a bunch of users who annotated the shape the same way, more or less, in a few different clumps? Makes sense. So we want to see the level of agreement between people, and spectral clustering is the mathy way to do that. Or statistical way, but basically, yeah. And they wanted to get a sense for the average area of agreement over the total area of the shape. So uh, if two shapes were exactly yeah. annotated the same, they would have a distance of zero. And if 1% of the area was annotated differently, then they would be have a difference of 0.01. And if two shapes were completely differently, they'd have a distance of one. And now putting it all together... Um, and so it really helped tease out the fact that uh, for a lot of these shapes, one representative annotation was not actually appropriate. Going back to the there's no right, like there's no right way <laughs> to do this. There's no one correct human perceptual approach. Um, and so I think two, having two representatives did a good job of representing most of the shapes, but some of them clearly want three um, and some of them want even more. So there's really no one way to skin a cat? <laughs> well, segment a cat, right? <laughs> but yeah, sometimes people agreed on one to two ways to break up an image into parts. And then some other images seemed like there was a lot more variation in how people define the parts or sections. Seems like there's still more research to be done. Isn't that always the case? 
the data set itself raises a bunch of other questions and there are always more projects and there are than there is time and so there are a lot of really interesting questions still unanswered like looking at sort of the geometric configuration of a shape can you tell in advance how many clusters you should you should expect to have in the annotation or some of the shapes were rotated versions of each other does rotation of a known shape like a cow something that we sort of map onto a real object in the world does the rotation affect people's annotation or or is it pretty consistent over rotation as compared to an artificial shape something that doesn't exist in the in the world does that that's just like a geometric abstraction does that rotated get different annotations or does it tend to be more consistent so there are there are a ton of questions that i want to know the answers to and i don't have time to go to the research so going back to what i was saying at the beginning of the episode i still think this falls under research conducted by academics It does, but it also recognizes this really important role that non-experts have to play. We specifically need people who aren't mathematicians or statisticians to participate in order to get studies like this to work. Is there a coda to this story? Like, do we have any updates on either their study or GISH? I actually have updates on both. First, when I spoke with Axel and Catherine, I found out they've had requests to share both their data and how they ran this study with other labs who want to replicate it. That's cool. More crowdsourcing research clearly needs to be done. But sadly, it won't be done through GISH. Why not? Well, the annual GISH competition did make it a habit to include community science and crowdsourcing research projects in later years. For example, in 2022, one of the challenges was to help NASA by processing an image from the JWST as part of the NASA data challenge. But you said, did? Yeah, full disclosure, I did participate in GISH last year. Shout out to my team, Off Grid Gishers. But afterwards, we found out that it was the last year Misha Collins would be running GISH. I think it was an incredible amount of work, so the scavenger hunt has been put on indefinite hiatus. That's too bad. You have to find some other ways to nurture your parasocial relationship with the actors on Supernatural. But GISH isn't the only way you can get involved with community science or crowdsourcing for science. Yeah, who needs Supernatural actors to convince folks to get involved with research? Okay, okay, I might like the show. Sheesh. (laughs) Told ya. Uh, We'll include some links in the show notes to other cool community science projects for our listeners to check out and participate in as part of Mathematical and Statistical Awareness Month including some of Axel's upcoming work. Well, I have a project right now where I work with the uh, ecologist to recognize birds in images. And so so we we are we need annotation basically and there are no public database that that contain enough uh, of these annotated images. So I have to design again interfaces, uh, user studies, I mean to 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 gather data. But definitely uh, I would say that I benefit from the experience. That's for sure. Well, Sadie, do you have any last thoughts, supernatural or otherwise, that we should share before we go? Actually, just one, but it's not my thought. It's from Catherine. Sort of working with Misha, who has a massive fan base, was very helpful towards getting a really great crowd. Um, So I highly recommend collaborating with celebrities when you're trying to do a user study. But the other thing that I will say is that because of this paper, Misha is one of a very few people in the world who has an Erdos bacon number. So a bacon number is how many degrees of separation you have from starring in a movie with Kevin Bacon. And then Erdos number is how many degrees of separation you have publishing with Paul Erdos. Um, very few people are both actors and people you know, publishing papers in some chain with Erdos, but this paper, this paper gave Misha uh, a, a Erdos Bacon number, and it is sixth. Wow, had to lean into that nerdiness there at the end, didn't we? For those who don't know, Paul Erdos was a famous and prolific Hungarian mathematician who wrote around 1,500 mathematical articles in his lifetime. So Misha Collins can say he's both X degrees from actor Kevin Bacon and Y degrees from Paul Erdos for a combined number of six? That's nerdy even for us. (laughs) 
Don't forget to check out our show notes in the podcast description for more about how to get involved with community science in a field that interests you. And if you like the show, give us a review on Apple Podcast or Spotify or wherever you listen. By rating and reviewing the show, you really help us spread the word about Carrie the Two so that other listeners can discover us. And for more on the math research being shared at MC, be sure to check us out online at our homepage, mc.institute. We're also on Twitter at mc underscore institute, as well as Instagram at mc.institute. And that's mc spelled I-M-S-I. And do you have a burning math question? Maybe you have an idea for a story on how mathematics and statistics connect with the world around us. Send us an email with your idea. You can send your feedback, ideas, and more to sadiewit at mc.institute. That's S-A-D-I-E-W-I-T at mc.institute. We'd also like to thank our audio engineer, Tyler Dammy, for his production on the show. And music is from Blue Dot Sessions. Lastly, Carry the Two is made possible by the Institute for Mathematical and Statistical Innovation, located on the gorgeous campus of the University of Chicago. We're supported by the National Science Foundation and the University of Chicago. Supernatural for life! No. You're not allowed to be tired. I am. Tu beso sea. Okay. Okay. You talk about Gishwes? About who? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Gishwes. Gish. Gishwes. No. <laughs> <laughs>